This is the Relevant Podcast. It's episode 954, and this is the Relevant Podcast here in Orlando. I'm your host, Cameron Strang, and joining me from Loverland, Virginia, it's Jesse Carey. Hello, hello. From Nacogdoches, Texas. She's back in East Texas uh, from, you know, going from Paris to Nacogdoches, you know, and, uh, only an upgrade. Downtown Emily <laughs> Brown. Hey, y'all. Hey, and joining me from my living room, artist, producer, mogul, Derek Miner. What's happening? He got me over here holding this uh, church mic, but we're going to do the talking though anyway. <laughs> I, I feel like you just changed change my name to Bishop Minor for the rest of the, this joint right quick. Derek, I recorded last week's episode in person at Cameron's house, and it was the same thing because of our you know kind of hardware setup. I I, I was I did a handheld. I got to say my arm was kind of sore. It made me really ex- really respect like stand up comedians. Uh, pastors, <laughs> um, you know, singers. How out, of shape, how out of shape do you have to be that your arm is sore from holding a mic for 40 minutes? You don't even have to hold it out the entire time. If you're not talking, you could kind of set it down. It's habit. It's habit. <laughs> for people behind the scenes, just now, as we were signing on, I was having a hardware issue, uh, as Clark knows. Given, I was giving Clark some heartburn leading up to this recording. And so the microphone that I usually use is is not working today. So I'm just using another solution. But I was leaning up to a microphone as if it was on speaking into it. I'm very uncomfortable not speaking into a microphone, having it away from my face. So as you said, a lot of microphone issues, Derek. I can relate all that to say. God, God bless Clark because we be sending Clark audio sometime. I'll be like, well, we'll see what he does with this one. Clark really <laughs> like the the, uh, the Dr. Dre of podcasts. Like... <laughs> That I like man, it. That man is 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 out here making it happen. We've got let's see, we've got two studio mics, AirPods, and a church mic. So let's see if we if the end result sounds like a cohesive podcast. Let's start. So we don't we don't post the uh, the videos as much, but the right. only thing this mic is missing is the big fuzzy red or blue or yellow right like mic so pop the sound booth knows which worship leader to turn down which worship exactly. which one that's, that's team, all it's missing. a little off yeah i was gonna say i want to tell you something if, if you want to find the most disgusting smell in your entire <laughs> life just take the foam filter off the church mic when y'all go to church sunday and just right. sniff the mic that oh. mug is going to smell like death. <laughs> Just letting y'all know. Is there a solution to clean mics, church mics? I heard I'm COVID you right didn't now. start in China. With one Wuhan <laughs> wet market. It was actually a small Baptist church in Arkansas. They took exactly. the foam off. And then COVID and that was got released. Yeah. Just a Petri dish. Now, <laughs> I, I think the solution is what I've always wanted for my podcasting career which is it's it's you know made famous by like Bob Barker right on Price okay. is Right but it's, <laughs> but it's a touch of class and style which long. is it's a very long like just a stick that, that, mic with like a golf ball on top. It looks like okay. a magic wand or something with a little yeah, fuzz ball on the end. With, yeah. Yeah, with a golf yeah. ball, with a ping pong ball on top, and it's very long. It's unnecessary long. It's like over a foot and a half long. And I can just hold it out here and just talk into my little golf ball. And it's very little surface area to collect <laughs> bacteria flying out of my mouth. So this I think it's a great y'all, solution. This is what I want y'all to do. I want y'all to go to the sound man at church uh, Sunday. And I want uh-huh. you to ask him, when's the last time you cleaned the mics? Some of y'all mics ain't been clean for 30 years. Like, just let y'all know. Some of the mics have had the bishop spitting on and you know some like if you go to a black church black church is sweat going everywhere <laughs> spit going everywhere they sinking at the top of their lungs and some of them mics have not been clean for mm. 30 years so mm. so i'm telling you just i'm on a church mic right now camera this look like a fairly new mic so i don't feel like you know yeah, what i'm right. saying like i'm at threat of getting the new covid uh <laughs> variant but i'm telling y'all that's the reason why y'all couldn't go to church on sunday because the cdc knew y'all weren't cleaning y'all mics <laughs> now, 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 now Derek, i do want to i do want to qualify one thing you said you said hey go to your your sound person at your church on sunday and ask them something 
Be careful. Everyone knows the most ornery person in ministry. Any ministry. Okay? You got you got people who are on the mission field that have been suffering. Okay? You got people doing intense counseling that have seen the worst of the worst in their congregation. You got pastors who are up there, you know, every week, you know, bringing it and, and all the feedback from their congregation. The most ornery person in that church no matter what the church is, is the sound person. No, it's one and, of two things. It's either that he's been there forever and he's just tired of everybody's crap, you know, like he's over it and he's kind of, you know, like you said, ornery. Or it's the 15-year-old kid from youth group who's interested in audio production and they and didn't have don't anybody nothing. else. Because mm-hmm. remember that viral clip where like the old school pastor like started calling people out in the congregation during service, and then he just turned his sights up on the 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 rebellion up in the sound booth, and the the kids up there just lounging around and not serving Jesus. Remember he like called out. Oh man, I love that clip. Look, I'm gonna tell y'all as a person that's been from church to church touring. Like in my early years, before I was able to take a sound man with me or before I was able to say like, hey, I want a certain thing. I remember going to a show and we had this whole writer. We like we need subwoofers for a rap concert, whatever. They didn't have nothing. And I asked the sound man, I'm like, yo, man, like what happened to the writer? He's like, oh, don't worry about it. I was like, but y'all don't have no subwoofers. He's like, no, we got a bass amp that the person plays bass through. We're just going to plug up the your (laughs) mic and put it in front of the amp. (laughs) <laughs> and it's going to do that. I was like, bro. Hey, look, it's either a Jerry Riggs thing where it's like, yeah. I see like six electrical fire hazards running through the sanctuary right now. <laughs> yes. Or you go to the smallest <laughs> church in the world and you go to that sound booth and you're like, I'm at the NASA control center in Houston. <laughs> like, you know, there's like, there's a hundred yep. people in this service. You could probably just lead acapella. But yeah, the sound person has one of those boards where you touch a button and all the levers go. Yep. Yeah. And they act like if you get, close to the sound booth like there's going to be a big big problem like they they've excommunicated people got kicked out of the church for getting too close to the sound booth like they, right. it's, it's 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 that's that's the spectrum it's either fire hazard or you're acting like you're you know recording you, you know a, the score to a james cameron movie <laughs> well we have a great show in store for you today speaking of movies Filmmaker, director, writer Adam McKay joins us. You know him from Anchorman, Step Brothers, those guys, but also more thoughtful stuff like Vice or The Big Short, and more, most recently, Don't Look Up. Uh, he's also currently doing the uh, HBO series Winning Time on the uh, 80s Lakers. I cannot recommend that because there's a lot of uh, seedy elements to that story. But Adam McKay is mm. coming up. Uh, we talked to him. Uh, he It's interesting. We have a feature with him in the new issue of Relevant, and his big message... But he wanted to talk to us. He wanted, we mentioned this when we kind of previewed the issue. He wanted to talk to us because he feels that the big issues facing humanity, Christians need, need to take the lead on. He had a message for Christians, and that is coming up later on the show. Don't miss it. Also, it's uh, Oscar weekend, so we have our very own Oscars edition of Epic Battle. Don't miss that either. But stay tuned right now. Tyler joins us for Relevant Buzz. You say that you want to change, but I hope you get everything you want. Everything you want. You say that you need release, but I hope you get everything you need. Everything but me. Cause I don't want to stick around trying to work it out when everything feels wrong. Everything feels wrong. But it's all You're listening to Muna. The song is Anything But Me. Well, today's show is brought to you by Evil Good. Now, let me ask you a question. How far would you go to protect the ones you love? I'm guessing as far as you had to, and that's exactly the premise of Hillsong Channel's new film, Evil Good, a gripping true crime documentary about faith in action. Set amidst the violent and drug-ravaged streets of Phoenix, the film tells the true story of ex-police detective Victor Escato, whose life is plunged into chaos when death threats are made against his family. Forced to take extreme measures to keep them safe, Victor must wade out into the darkness to confront not only those who wish to do him harm, but also the ghosts of his past, which have haunted him for far too long. Throughout it all, Victor is tested and he treads that line of faith and works, trusting God on one hand while on the other, getting down in the trenches and doing what's necessary. So if you're looking for a different kind of Christian cinema and this blend of true crime and faith is something for you, you can stream Evil Good at theevilgoodfilm.com. That's theevilgoodfilm.com.
Hey, before I bring on Tyler uh, for Relevant Buzz, I want to remind you guys about the exciting news that we have at Relevant. Just last week, we launched a new era for our content, and it's called Relevant Plus. It is a premium content subscription that we launched. There are multiple packages and options for you, but it is um, our best content delivered ad-free and in an enhanced way. So we have our digital magazine, um, which is ad-free and formatted beautifully or designed beautifully for tablets, phones, and desktop. We have a ad-free version of this podcast, which we're releases every Friday and Tuesday. So it releases early. We also have a subscriber exclusive podcast called Relevant Plus Conversations where you have the full uncut interviews uh, of the A-list people you see in the magazine. There are some phenomenal interviews. You'll hear five minutes here on the podcast, but there's 40 more minutes. And Relevant Plus Conversations is your uh, opportunity to hear the full conversation. It's really good. I'm excited about that one. Relevant Plus subscribers also get ad-free reading at relevantmagazine.com and unlimited articles every month. Um, And there's a lot more. We'll be dropping premium uh, articles, uh, long-form A-list celebrities uh, throughout uh, the year in between issues as well. And just stay tuned. We're going to be adding more and more as the year goes on. You can subscribe right now for as low as two fifty a month. It is a great way. Well, it's a better content experience, first of all, but it's also if you believe in what we're doing, it's a great way to support our work and help us do more of it. Check it out. You can find out all the information right there at relevantmagazine.com. Just click on the big old plus there at the header. All right, it's time for relevant buzz. <laughs> Please welcome to the show Relevant Senior Editor Tyler Huckabee telling us what's happening at the intersection of faith and culture this week. Hey, Tyler. Hey, everybody. What's the buzz? <laughs> that sounded so, so it sounded like ASMR. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just working. I'm not. I'm workshopping it. Leave me alone. I'm trying to figure out my segue. Yeah, I like it. I like, I like, yeah, I like what's the buzz. Maybe that should be our new, like, we can make that, see if we can work that into a jingle there, a little intro jingle. I like it. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is something Cameron, you and I kind of already discussed this news a little bit, but I wanted to throw it to to you all for a discussion about it uh, a little bit too. Have you guys in the middle of all this, I know it's really hard to stay away from any news about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Have you guys ever sat down and like listened to one of these, one of these speeches that Vladimir Putin gives with the, with the, like the translation, obviously you don't speak Russian. So you listen to the translation under it. Have you ever like tried to like actually listen to what he is saying to the Russian people about the military operation? I've only heard like the Russian state TV talking about special operations, stuff like that. Those, but not Putin himself. He was so reclusive for so long. It was his long table meetings. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of hard to find because he hasn't done it very much. He's been very, he's been very reclusive about all of this. And you've seen some of the photos maybe of him sitting at like the far end of the table from the rest of the Russian leadership because he apparently is, is kind of paranoid about some of this, maybe with good reason. But a clip that surfaced last, uh, right before last weekend was really, really interesting. And uh, we won't play it for you because it's obviously Russian. So you wouldn't necessarily understand it. But I did want to, uh, to read you a little bit of what it said. Said because this is really reminiscent of some of the stuff that you would hear here in the U.S. from politicians uh, and talking about this was actually at a at a big Russian celebration they they had it in Luzhniki Stadium I think it's pronounced Luzhniki if if you uh, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly it's where they held the World Cup and this was to celebrate the eighth anniversary of Russia's annexation of Crimea and uh, President Vladimir Putin actually addressed the ongoing invasion of Ukraine there and you get a chance to sort of hear how he's pitching this to the Russian people. Uh, he says actually that this war is a testament to this is and this is a quote to Russia's Christian values. Uh, he used scripture to to sort of support and defend the invasion here. He uh, he said this is quote it is to get people out of their misery out of this genocide. That is the main reason, the motive and purpose of the military operation. That, and that's what they're referring to this as a Russia and as a military operation, not an invasion that we began in Ukraine. And this is where the words from the scriptures come to my mind. There is no greater love than if someone gives his soul for his friends. Uh, that's, of course, a paraphrase of John 15, 13. So it's super interesting, not just to see the uh, see, see how this pitch works, 
works, but to sort of compare it to the ways that often here in the US, you hear the Bible and Christian values thrown around by our own politicians. Uh, and in this case, and sometimes obviously in American cases as well, it's to support something that is very indefensible and, and obviously not very, <laughs> doesn't really have a lot of Christian values to it. I, the thing that shocked me when I saw this and we reported about it is like my perception of communist Russia was similar to communist China. Not that necessarily Christianity is illegal, but it's a state controlled religious experience and there's hard boundaries on it because as a communist society, we're a secular society. So I couldn't believe when Putin said he was justifying the war because it extolled Russia's Christian values and then used scripture to justify it to, to, I thought again, secular uh -huh. government, communism. I, I, I just, I, I was jaw, jaw dropped. And Tyler and I were wondering if, like we saw the former administration pull some autocratic cues from Russia's playbook, you know, big state military celebrations and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm wondering if Russia's pulling a card from the right wing playbook where we're going to justify political motives with scriptures and I, I just i couldn't believe it i just couldn't believe it one thing about it if you want to get a mass amount of people to go along with oppressing and killing somebody just convince them that it's a message from god if you Ooh. do that you and that's a fact and that's not crusades, that's not to i mean, I mean yeah. crusades i mean historically if you want to get people to do some of the most evil mm -hmm. things and to mm. blot out their whole conscience, just convince them that they're hearing from God. If you do that, there's nothing that will stop. Th there's no now there's no thing in their conscience that's saying maybe we shouldn't do that. Right. Because mm. now you've warped it and twisted it a little bit. So it's, it's, it's this is an age old playbook. But 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 I don't even know if I don't even know if you know the communists. I don't even know if the Kremlin would consider themselves communist. Like I think they're kind of you know somewhere on the spectrum between communism and fascism. But right. they're certainly authoritarian. You authoritarian, know. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and you know. But there has been a you know Putin for a long time has tried to position the work of the Kremlin as in line with you know quote unquote Christian values. Like he sees himself as a unifier of the Eastern Orthodox Church. You know, a lot of his anti... I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, a lot of his, uh, you know, because prior to this, the invasion of um, uh, of Ukraine, you know, he faced a lot of human rights criticism for uh, restrictions on the LGBTQ community within Russia under the guise that he was, you know, uh, enforcing traditional Christian morality. Um, but I think his manipulation of of these kind of christian values you know point to his willingness to 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 you know derek your point uh to manipulate people spiritually to try to you know accomplish you know the these sort of you know political aspirations but there is a weird spiritual element to at least his stated motivations for um invading ukraine you know he has stated that he's trying to un quote you know unify the christian church and you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you can't bomb maternity wards and, and you know, just, you know, have unrestricted slaughter of civilians and, and call it Christian. But that's the level of manipulation he's willing to inflict to try to justify what he's doing there. Crazy. Emily, what's your thoughts? I w I'd love to hear what you got to say. Uh, I was gonna say, I do believe that the Russian Orthodox Church has like a bigger role than we realize. Part of that is because we our like view of Russia, like the news that we see is slightly skewed. You know, we don't, we really don't have like a full idea of what goes on in Russia because of the way that they have like controlled their image and stuff. But from what I've seen, it does have like, there are a lot of times where Russian Orthodox leaders do speak up and they are in the news and they do kind of like push, um, I don't want to say an agenda, but they do have like a very important role that I think we don't think about as often. So hearing this, it is shocking because we don't think of him as religious. But to your point, Derek, countries throughout history have always used scripture to justify their actions. Yeah. I mean, even you said like America itself, like slavery was just quote unquote justified through scripture. And we like, can look at that now and say that was wrong and that was a misuse of scripture. But in the time, no one was saying that. And so they're not calling out. And I think in Russia, I don't know if there's people in, 
in the country saying, hey, that's actually not what that scripture means. That is not how that scripture is supposed to be justified. Um, but I don't think they can. Yeah, I mean, it's it's shocking yeah, to hear, right. but it's Truth. not surprising. Well, and the other thing, too, is a lot of people who grew up in like kind of the American evangelical context were taught that using the Lord's name in vain is, you know, seeing something crazy happen on the street and going, oh, my God, or you know what I mean? But but in reality, using the Lord's name in vain is using him or his scripture for your own, you know, vanity or or destructive purposes. So and we see this all the time where someone will say, will justify what they're doing because they're doing it in the name of God or the name of God's word. When, when someone manipulates scripture or manipulates their affiliation with God for their own personal gain, that's using the Lord's name in vain. That's right. why it's detestable and it's one of the top commandments not to do, to say, I'm doing what I'm doing, but I'm holding up a Bible, so it's cool. Or I said a Bible verse, so you can't disagree with me. Or God told me to do this. You know, God told me to run for office. God told me that's using his name in vain. And that's where you get into a serious violation of, of God's commands, you know, it's really scary because I used to sit back and wonder, you know, how could Christians allow slavery? Like how could Christians allow the atrocities during the civil rights movement? How could Christians allow the crusades? Our desire are, because for a lot of us, we are uninformed with the scriptures and then our desire to be right. And then our, also our desire to not be ostracized can sometimes allow us to have this mob mentality where we're just running in a direction, not really thinking, is this really the will of God? You know what I mean? And it's really, really scary because I think at the core of it, you you have these great leaders that are great orators that are able to speak and all of it sounds great in the moment until we sit back and think about it. I think that's why that's that's why, you know, when you read the Bible, the Bereans were held high because they heard what the what the word was. And they said, well, let me research it for myself to make sure that this is actually what God is saying. I think that we need to definitely take on more of an, a Berean approach, especially when we hear things on the political spectrum about mm -hmm. what God's will is and is not, you know, it, it, it's basically like an authoritarian version of some kid in Christian college, you know, spiritually manipulating a classmate saying, God told me I was going to marry you. And we should date. <sighs> you know, God right. told me that it's like, did right. he? God did be, be mm -hmm. careful. Right. Now. Why but he ain't tell me? Yeah, exactly. But, but it's the same. It's the same type of mani spiritual manipulation on uh, obviously a much larger, more nefarious scale. But that's using the Lord's right. name in vain. Be careful if you're saying God told you to do something because you're invoking His name for your own agenda, and you're wading into some some dangerous territory here. You know, well, I, and God was so serious about that that in the law, if a prophet were to give a word and say, God said to do this, and that word didn't come to pass, pass Jesse, what happened? I know you know. That was the, the capital punishment. I mean, that was capital a capital punishment. offense. Yeah. Cap that's a mm -hmm. capital offense for you to say, God told us, told me that this was going to happen. And if it did not happen, then you were to be taken to the middle of the <laughs> middle of the town and be stoned. That's how God, that's how serious he took his name. I mean, the Israelites took the Lord's name so serious that they wouldn't even write it. Yeah. And we just throw Jesus around on everything. We throw Jesus and, and we throw Yahweh around everywhere. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think we got to get back to a level of being like the Bereans and actually, you know, holding each other accountable for how mm -hmm. we, how we steward the name of the Lord, because we got the American church and the church, some of these rich churches at large got Christianity looking, looking, looking rough. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this is why God says, don't rough. take my name in vain. Yeah, because you're going to have it. me out here looking stupid. Yeah, this is all y'all. <laughs> why y'all? <yeah. laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, like, like I said, it, it's, it's the same form of spiritual manipulation we've all experienced or at least witnessed. But just like I said, now it's being weaponized by an authoritarian regime. 
and you're like, okay, this is a big, big deal. And maybe we should all be very cautious. Anyone says God said or God told me, you know. All right. What else you got, Tyler? All right. In a very different note. And, and and not nearly as important. Uh, is anybody is it? Are, are you guys? Is anybody in here still watching the Oscars? Are you guys like ready for the Oscars? Is this like right, on back. your radar as a oh Oscars are this week? Ready for the memes about the Oscars? Yeah, yeah. Like the sure. social media discourse. <laughs> for sure. yeah. fun, right? that's my favorite part. I, I more like the idea. Yeah, the idea of the Oscars is more fun than the Oscars at this point, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. See, yeah. you guys are highlighting the problem that the Oscars are facing right now, which is, as you, you may be aware of this, viewership is, has been falling off a cliff for the Oscars for a long time now. And every year they're like, we're going to shake things up and we're going to bring the kids back to the Oscars. And this year has the most... How do you do fellow kids energy of any Oscars <laughs> broadcast, really any ostensibly serious oh, broadcast Don't in say recent that. memory? And I, it's terrible. I, in order to write about this, to report about this on Relevant, I brought back our long dormant column Kids Corner, which you can go read if you want to. We won't be, I, I, won't, I won't read it verbatim, here, no. but I do love when we get a chance to do Relevant Kids Corner. Um, but I'm just going to read you a few of the changes <laughs> that the Oscars are making. Well, this first off, let's talk about some of the the presenters that people will be bringing to the, some of the people who will be handing out trophies at the esteemed at Hollywood's biggest night. Uh, we have people like noted film critic, uh, DJ Khaled, uh, Tony Hawk, <laughs> Sean White, <laughs> Kelly Slater, Travis Barker, the drummer for Blink-182. This is like what a 90 million year old person's idea of what, Kardashian's boyfriend. of what kids would be. Like, we'll get a skateboarder in a... St- Did they consult any kids? <laughs> and, and it's not... It's not actually, it's, it's, it's skateboarders and rock stars in their fifties who were yeah, young in yeah. the nineties. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not, not like Nigel Houston or yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's the only skateboarder oh, anybody over 60 has ever heard of. Like, like, to, like that kind of skateboarder. <laughs> <Yeah>. you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. But that's not the worst of it. Now they're doing like teen twenties towards categories. That's just yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so we Keep also going. need to talk about what they've cut out of the Oscars award because they've cut out a ton of the broadcast. Eight of the awards that they usually present are, are no longer going to be presented at the broadcast. So best original score, film editing, production design, makeup, hairstyling, documentary. You said short best subject. original score is cut? Cut. So these, these are like what makes a movie. Like the score is what like people talk about scores and they're not going. You're not going to be able to see that happening live. That is going to be. Nobody cares. Taped ahead of time. Good. And then they'll like I say good. sit in throughout the broadcast like a little moment. Montage Shut of what up, you missed. Cameron. <laughs> I said good. I don't care about editing. Just give me the the movie stars. Editing is the <laughs> most important part of a movie. Editing is the number. Ah, we don't know <laughs> editors. We want directors and actors. Sure. So That's all we need. We don't need. We don't need all the behind the is scenes. Is Tom people. Holland presenting at all? <laughs> is he doing anything? Tom is. Is Tom Holland doing anything? I don't know because they've had some weird stuff with invites. Yeah, they have had some weird. They have had some invite issues because, like, for example, Rachel Ziegler, who is the 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 lead the lead of West Side Story uh, is not was not invited to the Academy Award, but DJ Khaled is going to be there. So it's uh, it's interesting who and it was nominated for Best Picture too. And it was nominated for Best Picture. I don't think DJ Khaled was in any Best Picture nominated movies this year or any other. He wrote the but- score. For the eyes of Tony <laughs> Fay. Look, shout out to DJ Khaled. I'm gonna tell you why. Because why? DJ Khaled is running it up. This man has been at the NBA All Star Game. He's been getting oh, checked yeah. six years in a row. He does like this. Yeah. Hey, shout out to Khaled. Look, I need some Khaled hustling yeah. me because Dude, Khaled be in places. You're true. like, what is he doing at this golf tournament? Like, <laughs> when I was in high school, he was the local. He was the local DJ here in Orlando and he would do the Friday night mix thing, you know, where they have the DJ mix for two, three hours on Friday night, Saturday go. nights. That was DJ Khaled here in Orlando. He's the soundtrack of my youth. And then I go off Let's to college, go. he went to Miami and then he became DJ Khaled. Okay. You know? Can anyone name a DJ Khaled song from the last five years? Are you kidding me? He's had so many number he, ones. He's had so many hits. Name one. Um, he's got the Bieber one. Uh, he's got that's uh, not the, the name. name. Is that the name? I don't think that's the name of the song. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can see the video in my head. I don't know song names. All I do is win. Dang. 
They no, are. That's not five years. That's older. All I do is win is like 20. <laughs> yeah, that's older. <laughs> but last five years, I, I could not do one for yeah. last five years. No. That's a, no. I know he's putting out no music, one. and I do like him. I can't name a single one of his songs, though. He just did one with Mary J. Blige. That was promoted real big at the NBA All-Star Again, game. Again, what's the name? <laughs> Who knows? I can't tell you the name of any song that I listen to that I like. You know, like, I don't know. That's a problem. Emily's exposing some truths here. Let's not let's not act like the Oscars have not always been decidedly mid-brow yes. when it comes to host and entertainment. No argument. I mean, there was like a, a tough ten-year stretch where they would just argue, where they would just alternate between Whoopi Goldberg and Billy Crystal as host. <laughs> now I'm to have no shade against either Whoopi Goldberg or Billy Crystal, but was anyone ever excited when they're yeah. like, "Did you hear Billy Crystal's hosting again?" You know what I mean? Like it's straight down the middle. You know, well, Jesse, what they're but what, what they're doing to the Oscars is what. And TV did the baseball with rock and jock. They're trying to like jazz it up for the next generation and like they throw out what the Oscars was. I don't know. I kind of like that. They all get fancy. It does and feel it's, a little XFL. It feels right. It feels like trying too hard. It feels like a church trying to be down with the young people. So they're going to do this edgy, you know, <laughs> strength performance group or something you know just come on but 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 to their credit last year they went the other direction and they tried to make it as classy and classic hollywood that steven soderbergh directed it they yeah, made it, it really remote. like nobody cared yeah, yeah but, but they tried to make it a very like high falutin high <laughs> you know profile of fit you know like high class affair and i was like well this is just boring <laughs> i'd rather them go a little more in tv than basically me watching a homework assignment for two hours they overshot yeah i think they overshot <laughs> right i'm just saying if tom holland is not anywhere do hope like <laughs> he is the biggest <sighs> like tom holland is like the tom cruise of this generation like he's a star star so i'm like start there start with the marvel films the comic book films the films that everybody had loves to hate on at the odds that's the issue they're like man how can we attract the kids without like big upping the things that they love and it's like no you gotta like you gotta show some love to the stuff these kids are in there it's uncharted they're into spider-man they're into all this other stuff man show some love like you know what i mean but nah they don't want to do that let's just go get tony hawk and have him pull so up you're getting to so so derek you're getting to you're getting to where you're to, this is this is a good transition this is true because they are introducing two new categories that this has not been done before and these two new categories are called best kiss they're they're called they're called this these are both hashtags best on the oscar scene. website they're both hashtags oscar fan favorite no. and oscar cheer moment in which fans movie no. watchers can nominate their <laughs> own f- favorite their cheer moment which is their bit you know like when all three spider-men are out there together i don't know whatever i don't even know what you would nominate but a moment where you cheered in the theater and then you will also nominate your your fan favorite so you know no way home doesn't get nominated for best picture but maybe it can take home the the how you do how do you do fellow kids award of the year which i don't even know if it's going to be an oscar <laughs> trophy or if it's just bragging rights or if it's a hot dog Derek or literally what. just walked away he's so upset <laughs> he but, but, so, Ty, but real talk you you don't think the producers their first call was like tom holland and zendaya like I'm sure you know like hey maybe we could get them but but you know how far down the list are they are they possibly where they're calling wanda sykes and amy schumer no <laughs> shade on either of them but this is oscars yeah spider-man's gonna get a hashtag oscar cheer moment oscar i mean like how embarrassing is that where you hang that trophy up at where you gonna hang the hashtag know, right? hashtag um, oscar cheer LOL moment. trophy where you gonna hang that at <laughs> nobody want no zany's award nobody right right yeah. nobody wants this Nobody's asking for this. We have the People's Choice Awards. You know we what? have the MTV VMAs. That we do was, not that, need this. That's the yeah. Affirmative Action Award. That's the look. We know y'all <laughs> oh, know. Gosh. We know y'all good. We know that you're you're uh-huh. outselling all of our movies, but we're not gonna show no love. So here we just gonna give you this Affirmative Action Trophy right here. Oh, I'm out well, here. So what's bro. funny is I've seen some stuff about this because. I've seen people on Twitter that are like, what if we got a movie that was actually not that great to win this award just to kind of like show that it's a joke. 
So Amazon came out with a really terrible version of Cinderella last year. It was so bad. I'm assuming y'all didn't watch it. I unfortunately did. It was terrible. But it was like leading the polls for... I didn't even know it was it existed. I don't even lie. It was so bad. But it was like leading the polls because I was looking to see like... what Because I think they had something where you could see kind of what was in the lead. And that was in the lead. And people were tweeting like, yes, this movie is bad. But it's so funny if it's if we can say it won Wait an Oscar. Wait a second. So the internet is going to Bodie McBoatface the Oscars. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm putting a tweet out. I'm down. Let's do <laughs> so it. So pick the worst movie you saw last year and just become its number one fan on Twitter. <laughs> but 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 real but universe. real talk with the Oscars too. I mean, it, it's not like they are okay. Let's say from like two years ago or whatever. It's like how many of you guys have even seen Nomadland once? Much less. It's like ah, it's Friday night. Let's fire up Nomadland again. That you know slow burn about people working at Amazon factories. But how many people watch Endgame? Yet one gets you know not only nominated but a wins an award, but is kind of forgotten reasonably quickly. It's again, it's fine movie but it's never been about what films actually are the most culturally impactful or the one that most people like so like kind of casting those films off to the side for some joke twitter poll it's like why why even bother it's just making light of how out of touch they are you know yep yep all right what's next uh, last thing we can do this really fast uh, is uh, I did want to call I really really enjoyed this uh, a new single we got from our friends Johnny Swim which they did with uh, with a rapper that we're very excited about Toby and Wigway that's the latest single off of their upcoming self titled album I gotta ask I gotta ask you well, hold on Tyler you say Johnny Swim you don't say Johnny Swim I, I hit the accent on did the I swim say, you hit the Johnny real did I hard. put the accent on the wrong spot <laughs> Johnny Swim. <laughs> well, I don't know. I always just I say, say Johnny. It? I just say Johnny Swim. All we know is Johnny is swimming. Is that's what we know? Johnny, Johnny swimming. Johnny Swim. <laughs> yeah. Johnny Swim. It's like it's like uh, Adult Swim. It's like all right, right now it's Johnny Swim. <laughs> Only Johnnies can get in the public pool. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Johnny I, Swim. I think I said. Right, I think I just ahead. threw off the. I think my 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 non regional dialect just kind of left me for a second, but it's back. Johnny Swim. <laughs> Johnny Swim. <laughs> now I'm in my head about it. Johnny Swim. <laughs> <laughs> and Tobe did a song. This is called Desmond's song, uh, and it is uh, it is inspired uh, for for the for the Desmond heads out there. This was inspired by Lost. Uh, he wrote it while he was watching the show. Abner wrote it with Amanda while they were watching the show. Could never quite make it work. Couldn't quite get get it together. Uh, finally, kind of cracked the code during quarantine and put this on the new album. And uh, Toby said he wanted to drop a verse on it, which he did. And he also directed a music video, which you can watch over relevantmagazine dot com. Uh, here is a clip of the song. I know my name's being called A lot of has just stopped going off Yeah, I know there's things to do But when I wake up, I won't see you over my eyes, you cannot see me. I cannot see you. We play peekaboo far too often for me to not peek at you. Hell, you put this shock in me like Pikachu. And I'm buzzing for your love. And if it wasn't for the beat of my heart, you so that is the so so that is off of the upcoming uh album Johnny Swim, it's self titled. Uh, I would guess if, if I was a betting man that you might be hearing a little more from some of the people involved in that album here in the coming weeks as we get closer to the release date. But excited, always excited to hear more from Johnny Swim. Very very cool. All right. Well, for more, check out uh, what we're covering every day over at relevantmagazine.com. Follow us on all the socials and make sure that our site is part of your daily uh, web browsing. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, everybody. That'll do it for Relevant Buzz. Stay tuned. Up next, Adam McKay joins us. You're listening to Cathedral Bells. The song is Fall Into Place. See, I thought the Cathedral Bells were more regal sounding. Chiny. Well, today's show is also brought to you by the Lumo Project. Lumo is a stunning visual Bible project that will help you see the gospel in a compelling new light. It's a cinematic gospel experience where you can experience Jesus' teachings and story in a completely 
new way. Check out Luma's free scripture videos by searching The Lumo Project at YouTube. Uh, And for other free resources, including small group studies and more, check out LumoProject.com. That's L-U-M-O Project.com. Well, our guest today is Adam McKay. He's an award-winning director and producer behind movies like The Big Short, Vice, Anchorman, Step Brothers, and most recently, Don't Look Up. He was even nominated for two Oscars this weekend. Well, Adam sat down with Tyler for an insightful conversation into climate change and why he thinks the future of our world is up to the church. Here's our conversation with filmmaker Adam McKay. This isn't happening. Kate, uh, tell me this isn't really happening. I hear there's uh, something you don't like the looks of. We discovered a very large comet. Oh, good for you. It's headed directly towards Earth. This comet is what we call a planet killer. At this exact moment, I say we sit tight and assess. Uh, so, Adam, the first thing I want to ask, and we'll get into some of the more, some of the, the faith-centric stuff in a minute here, um, but I want to ask, when you first started scripting this movie, uh, I feel like you kind of have to put sides together. And how do you decide when you're making a movie like this, who's going to be sort of, in the case of this movie, the uh, in favor of doing something about the incoming asteroid and who is not going to be? What kind of person is, is <laughs> interested in taking, in taking it seriously and what kind of person is not taking it seriously? Well, you know what I did? I used the old cheat of let's look at the world right now. So uh, (laughs) I I think it's no secret that the movie is in a lot of ways about the climate crisis. But I think it's, you know, as we've learned, I think it's also about deeper rejections of of truths for careerism, for ego, for politics, for poll numbers, for money, uh, for uh, uh, delusion. And so, you know, in doing that, uh, it's not so hard. You just have to look around the world that we live in right now. I want to get to something that was interesting to me that I did not see coming. And I usually have kind of an antenna up for issues like this, but I did not see Ewell's prayer coming at the very end. And I thought it was very beautiful and very poignant, but it was very surprising because that, that felt like a, a left turn from where a movie movies like this tend to usually go with their, with their religious characters. So can you tell me how that, how you decided to do that? Yeah, that actually came out of a great conversation with one of my co-producers, Ron Suskind, who's a a, a journalist, author. He just, uh, you know, one of the great things about having people like that involved in your movie is they ask you a lot of questions. And Ron just asked me, where's faith in all of this? And it was like in a duh moment where you you sort of forget that. You know, uh, we've seen faith politicized and weaponized and distorted by so many uh, egos and self-interested parties over the last, uh, I was going to say 10 years, but I realized you could almost say 2,000 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. That we, we forget that there is this personal relationship with faith that is really beautiful and profound that I've had in my life. And the second he said it to me, it was like the last puzzle piece fit together for the movie. And I knew instantly who Yule was. And I, within an hour, went into the script, rewrote it, talked to Timothy Chalamet. I know who your character is. I know why you're in the movie. And by my reckoning, it, it's uh, the most beautiful you know, moment of the movie. It, it gets me every time I watch it. Dearest Father and Almighty Creator, we ask for your grace tonight, despite our pride, your forgiveness, despite our doubt. Most of all, Lord, we ask for your love to soothe us through these dark times. May we face whatever is to come. I am religious and I am very concerned about climate change and it has been a 
very frustrating for me that so many people in my own faith tradition have often seemed to be one of, if not the biggest, like obstacles in actually addressing this. And that's just kind of my like self-perception maybe in some cases. So I found it really beautiful and and I would say encouraging in a way that I wasn't really expecting. Because on the whole, I don't know that I would call this an encouraging movie or it didn't leave me, I don't know if I would say in an encouraged place about the state of the next, you know, 50, 100 years or so. Yeah, I, I would say this, that here's the part that for me, is encouraging is that we're able to make a movie like this that we as an you know as an animal are able to tell a story of how we may a lot of us may die before it happens and and Mm -hmm. i would say this to anyone who has faith which i have faith and I would say that's a gift from the higher power. Mm-hmm. The, the idea that we're able to uh, imagine things in the future, that we were given this gift of thought and understanding. And, you know, the big thing I talk to with a lot of these actors, and I certainly talked about it with Chalamet, is that scientists are sometimes treated by certain people of faith as you know, outside of the sphere of understanding God's world. And I think the important thing to remember about scientists, every scientist I've ever met, I've met a lot through doing this work. Sure. They're very humble. They're very quiet. They listen, they watch, and what they're listening to and what they're looking at is, if you want to say it this way, God's creation. Your breathing is stressing me out. This will affect the entire planet. I know, but it's like so stressful. If your house is on fire, your house is on fire. And pretending everything's cool and you can still hang out in your den because that room isn't on fire is delusional. And I would go back to a faith-based approach here. (laughs) We were gifted Uh with fear and urgency for a reason. Here's the really good news. We have science. Science is amazing. Science is Excalibur. Science is the ultimate gift from the higher power uh, because it can do incredible things because these, in my opinion, these are really our holy people. These are really the people that are paying attention and listening to the creation of the universe. And we have it. We can do it. We have renewable energy. We have uh, some initial promising technology about carbon removal. Uh, There are a lot of really powerful tools at our disposal. The problem right now is no one is using them. Our leaders have been blinded by their own sense of power. Uh, Our economy is corrupted. And you know what's crazy about it? You look at the religious texts throughout history, they all have this story, whether it's yeah. Jesus, you know, casting the money yeah. lenders out of the temple, whether it's, you know, uh, whichever religion you subscribe to, this is an old, old story. So we know exactly what to do. And I really am a believer that people of faith are going to be the bedrock of this movement. There's a comet headed directly towards Earth. Do you know how many the world is ending meetings we've had over the last two years? Drought, famine. Hole in the ozone is so boring. That was Adam McKay. You can read more of that conversation in the spring issue of Relevant. You can view it for free at relevantmagazine.com. And you can also get the enhanced experience by becoming a member or subscriber to Relevant Plus. All right. Stay tuned up next. It's our Epic Battle Academy Awards edition. You're listening to Yacht Club. The song is You Don't Know Me. (laughs) Okay, it's time for... Epic Battle 
It's Oscar weekend, so we thought we would do an Oscar-themed version of Epic Battle. If you haven't heard this game before, it's two teams. It's a debate-style uh, competition where we are going to settle once and for all all these little Spider-Man's better than Batman internet nerd arguments. We are going to just take them by the horn, settle them, and that's what Epic Battle is. We're doing an Oscar-themed edition, so we're going to get it right where the Oscars did not. We're going to fill in the gaps. So uh, the teams are Tyler is joining us once again. He's still on. Hey, Tyler. Uh, it's going to be Tyler and Derek versus Jesse and Emily. Uh, Tyler and Derek, I need your team name. Kids Choice Awards. <laughs> okay. It's the Kids Choice Awards uh, versus Jesse and Emily. I was going to say we our team name is a little cumbersome, but it's Billy Crystal Whoopi Goldberg <laughs> Energy. Old school Oscars, baby. Is that the full title? Because I, w- mm-hmm. I only agree if it's the full title. Yes. Okay. Billy Crystal Whoopi Goldberg Energy versus the Kids <laughs> Choice Awards. Okay. Got it. Here we go. Uh, The first category is going to be most convincing on screen flirting. That is, that is the category. Most convincing on screen flirting. Uh, Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, Energy. You guys have DJ Khaled and uh, Kids Choice Awards. You guys have Jason Momoa three weeks into giving up working out for Lent. So it's not peak Jason Momoa. He's three weeks into Lent giving up working out. So that's Kids Choice Awards. All right. Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, Energy. Please tell Clark, who will be the judge, why you feel that they would, that, that, uh, <laughs> that DJ Cal would be better at most convincing on screen flirting. I mean, Emily, you know, maybe you can back me up on this, mm-hmm. but I've never seen a DJ Khaled not in deep flirtation mode, even when it's a selfie. I, one time I watched about a 10 minute epic. It's very uncomfortable. It is. Even if he's talking to himself, I believe he's flirting with himself. I one time watched <laughs> a whole 10 minute montage of him getting lost on a jet ski at night in the canals of Miami. And yeah. he was fearing for his life. Okay. Yeah. And begging someone to call the Coast Guard. And I still felt like he was kind of flirting with me through Snapchat. So I, I think this one is, is they're kind of a sandbag because I don't think DJ Khaled's capable of not flirting. All right. Uh, Kids Choice Awards. Tell us why Jason Momoa, three weeks into giving up working out for Lint, would be better at the most convincing on-screen flirting. Okay. Have you seen Jason Momoa? <laughs> <laughs> have you have, like have you actually, he can flirt though have you actually laid eyes on him like Jason Momoa could not work out he could not work out for three years and would just look like a normal Tennessean like it's it's, it's, it's like he's the, the guy is is like right. a freaking like he literally is like a god Aquaman like so all I'm saying is all he gotta do is just flirt. Look, he could lift his shirt up. That's a flirt. If if Jason Momoa <laughs> just take his shirt off, even after three weeks of not working out, and he just his six packs just aren't as defined. Look to me. Uh-huh. All I'm saying is, look, I'm just He's Jason good. Momoa, DJ Khaled. I mean, I love Khaled. You know, he makes some hot records. But just Jason Momoa just take his shirt off, and then that's a flirt. All the girls <laughs> gonna go crazy. That's just Billy, my Billy opinion. Crystal Whoopi Goldberg energy. What's your rebuttal, Emily? Take this home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Derek does bring up a good point. Jason Momoa very attractive, whether he's worked out or not. I will agree with that. But in order to flirt well, you do have to have like confidence and personality. And after three weeks of not working out, he yeah. might be not in the greatest mental headspace. And a man who puts out a song called uh. All I Do Is Win, that's confidence. So he will win flirting, whatever that looks like, every single time. Whereas Jason, you know, he might not be in a great, like, if you're not in a good headspace, looks can only take you so far. But confidence <laughs> is key. I mean, the fact, hey, big respect for DJ Khaled's Instagram because he's shirtless a lot. And I'm just like, nobody really wants to see that. But like the confidence that he has, like he pulls it off. All he needs to do to flirt is yell his name. And if that doesn't DJ work, just Khaled. yell, we the best music and done and done. Flirtation done. over. He only has two lines and they work right. every time. All right. All right. Hang on. Hang on. It's All right. Kids Choice Award. What's, what's your final? We just final got point. done talking about God in line. Sorry. I'm sorry, Tyler. 
<laughs> it's two two things really really quick. First of all, I I saw I was I was out I was in Joshua Tree and I saw Jason Momoa. He walked he walked. I was at a restaurant. Jason Momoa walked in with Lisa Bonet. Lisa Bonet. You can't just she doesn't just follow guys or like any random guys around. He was with Lisa Bonet and I was like I want to run away with you, Jason. Where are we Where are we going? Throw me in the back of the motorcycle. Let's go. And and more more importantly, more to the point, I think that DJ Cal. I got respect for Kyle Khaled, but every time I've seen him do something that isn't DJ. I'm sorry. It hasn't been like when I've seen him try to dribble a basketball. I've seen him try to play a guitar. It, they, it's not yeah. exactly. I feel like he's a really one lane man, and and this does not see. This seems okay. a little outside of the lane. So that's why I'm going with Jason. Final point: Girls like funny guys. I just want that to be said. <laughs> So just keep that in mind. Jason's funny. There you go. All right. Jason's All right. Funny. Most convincing on screen flirting. Jason Momoa, three weeks into giving out, working up for Lent or giving up, working out for Lent or DJ Khaled. Clark, who got you? <laughs> I do think that maybe in this case, DJ Khaled might have a little bit more of the charisma, a little bit more of the charisma. Wow. That's, that's, that's is that your answer? Ridiculous. Yes, it is. This is ridiculous. Okay. Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg energy. Get the point. Ridiculous. All right. Here we go. Mm. 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 Okay. Next category. Hmm. Blocking the choreography for the next West Side Story remake. Okay. Uh, Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, Energy. You have all three Spider-Men and Kids' Choice Awards. You have the Encanto family. Blocking the cate- the choreography for the next West Side Story remake. You said blocking? What you mean blocking? Teaching the choreography, t- making up the choreography. Oh, yeah. okay. Got you. Okay. All right. For Kids' Choice Awards. All right, you're up first. Kids' Choice Awards. Tell us why the Encanto family would be better. This is easy. Encanto is a musical, and you know, obviously, the Spider Man guys they've they've got a lot of uh, you know they're pretty good at like swinging around the city. But but you, when you if you need if you need to hammer a nail, you call in a hammer. You don't call in Spider Man. In this case, the musical uh-huh. is the nail, and and the Encanto family, in addition to their various you know kind of uh-huh. like super power, super talents, th- they've done this already. We've seen them in action. They're nominated for for best animation feature because they're in a musical and they've they've blocked themselves perfectly well. It's a very impressive feat. So I, I'm going to have to say that it's it feels a little unfair even for this matchup because Encanto's got this one in the bag. Wow, Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, Energy. Tell us why all three Spider Men be better at blocking the choreography for the next West Side Story remake. Yes, uh, Tyler, you could not be more wrong because if there is anybody that could do it, it is specifically Tom Holland because I know for a fact he has a background in dance and if you've ever seen his lip sync battle where he did the Rihanna dance a little too well, he has the moves and he has choreography down. So I can't speak much for the other two, but if Tom Holland's leading it, they're doing fantastic. And honestly, Andrew is like a great actor. I'm sure you could pick it up. Toby, you know, we'll see. But Tom will lead the way, and I have full confidence in him. Okay, uh, Kids Choice Awards, tell uh, what's your rebuttal? So, Emily, you gonna sit up here with a straight face, and you gonna tell me that Tom Holland and two accountants are gonna outdance the whole Encanto <laughs> family, all that Caribbean beautiful. Dancing culture, <laughs> you sit there telling Columbian. me that y'all that these these three white dudes finna do that. What? Which, what <laughs> if that's what y'all telling me? Then I got some oceanfront property in South Dakota <laughs> that I would love to sell y'all because I don't even think that they even seen bongos and drums. Hispanics, that's look. That's what black folks and Hispanics do. We get up here and we get the party popping. Have you ever been to a Cinco de Mayo? I mean, I know that's Mexico. You know what I'm saying? But I'm saying, like, have you ever been to with around a Hispanic family at like just playing dominoes at a party? We kick it. That's what you know what I'm saying. I'm not Hispanic, but I feel like I am. You know what I'm saying today. So I'm just speaking out for all my peoples at the Econo cast, telling you we not gonna get out dance by no doggone uh Tom Holland and uh County <laughs> and somebody uh that worked for T D Ameritrade. So there we go. <laughs> Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg Energy, what's your final point? Fair point, Derek. Uh, but there's no way Spider-Man are going to beat them at their own game. The last time I checked, 
West Side Story and Encanto are musicals. Musicals are terrible and boring. It's just a fact. So if you put Spider-Man in there, they're going to decide. We're not going to dance better than all these people. We're not going to sing better. We're just going to make West Side Story into a Spider-Man movie. Maybe you're watching West Side Story and they're singing and dancing going on. You're like, what the heck? I walked into a musical. I thought this was like some sort of like really interesting urban story. All of a sudden, Green Goblin shows up. Now it's a Spider-Man movie and everybody's happy. You got your little song at the beginning. We're no way. To your point, there's no way they're beating the Encanto family at their own game. They're just going to turn it into a Spider-Man movie. And who doesn't like a Spider-Man movie? Listen, That's yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, Columbia, Not Columbia is popping. That's all I'm saying. And I'm saying, I we ain't getting beat by no doggone accountants. There you go. <laughs> Clark, who convinced you? Because people need to learn blocking in this situation, it's going to go into Encanto, I think. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. His choice was tie game. Yeah. All right, it's tie right now. 1-1. One, one. Stuck it. Stuck the land. All right. Last category is uh, doing the stunts for the ne- next Mad Max movie. The, who would win in the, doing the stunts for the next Mad Max movie between uh, Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg Energy. You have Lady Gaga still in character from House of Gucci. And Kids Choice Awards, you have Jessica Chastain trapped in her eyes of Tammy Faye makeup. So who between those would do the stunts for the next Mad Max movie better? Uh, we'll start with you, Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, Energy. E- Emily, I'll kick this one off if you want If you want to take it home. Um, Sounds good. I don't know if you guys want, I don't care what character she's in. Did you see Lady Gaga at the Super Bowl? She jumped off the top of the whole freaking stadium to mm. kick off the show. She, it doesn't matter. I, as far as I'm concerned, she's always in that same character. I don't know. I don't know that I know what the real Lady Gaga's like. I don't care what character she's in. She jumped like a flying squirrel off the top of the Super Bowl. Okay. Okay. She did. You don't do that and not have stunt energy. That's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. She was in a sequence, like onesie thing, and just, it was like, where's Lady Gaga? I thought she was performing. The camera pans up. She's on the top of the stadium. She just jumps off. Okay. She, if she can handle that, she can handle some Mad Max driving around a desert. All right, Kids Choice Awards. Tell us why uh, Jessica Chastain trapped in her eyes of Tammy Faye makeup would be better at doing the stunts in the Ned next Mag- Mad Max movie. Tyler, go ahead, bro. Yeah, I, I can I can take this one. So uh, Jessica Chastain in eyes of Tammy Faye, much like the actual Tammy Faye, was caked in multiple layers of makeup that probably added an extra maybe inch, maybe two inches to her actual body, giving her an incredible amount of protection. No matter what, if she could throw herself from a moving vehicle, dive and roll along the ground, and she wouldn't even feel, it would protect her from the elements. That would give her, like it would give, like it gave Tammy Faye herself, an incredible amount of confidence and fearlessness to survive whatever, whatever director uh, George Miller might throw at her, because the, there's no car crash there is no there's no dive even from the top of the super bowl there is no uh, plummet to, to the depths of the australian desert that could penetrate her uh this 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 makeup uh and wig and uh, eye mascara shield that she has ensconced herself with so I, I think that she would easily be able to handle any of the stunts and get up and get back and do another take and another take after that all right okay okay uh What's your rebuttal, Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, energy? Um, I just feel like it really comes down to physicality and like, you know, Lady Gaga, she seems real scrappy and I feel like she could get just thrown around in the desert, especially if she's in her House of Gucci character. That woman was crazy. So like she will withstand physical and mental turmoil. Jessica Chastain as Tammy Faye, I think she could handle some mental challenges. I think she would last... I'll give her 15 seconds physically and she is just crying about it. So mm. I just don't think she's lasted long. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm. All right. Final point. Kids choice words. <laughs> Look, all I'm going to say is this. Is there anything in the year two of our Lord 2022 more dangerous than being an evangelical, how you got to twist yourself and contort yourself in all these different ways to try to make certain stuff make sense that don't make no sense. This girl, uh-huh. and right now, she as a Christian evangelical, shoot, she going to do all the Mad Max stunts, back flips, front flips, car wheels, all that, because that's all evangelicals been doing for the past 
since Donald Trump been in office, that's all evangelicals been doing is having to do all kind of backflips, front flips, cartwheels, all that stuff. So for me, Jessica Chastain, I mean, she just got to keep doing what they've been having to do for this whole time. So shoot, I'm like, she already, hey, look, they doing stunts right now. <laughs> there you go. All right, who convinced you, Clark? I think Lady Gaga's got this in the bag for uh, the extreme. <laughs> hey, I ain't gonna lie. I'm pulling all that out. <laughs> 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 hey, Clark, Clark, I ain't even mad, bro. I had to go. I had to reach to the sky for that one, dog. So. <laughs> Derek was doing like Matrix bullet time dodges. I commend you. All right, so Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, Energy, two to one, two to one, uh, won the Oscars edition of Epic Battle. Well, before we wrap things up, I want to thank Adam McKay for joining us today. Make sure to catch his latest film, Don't Look Up. It's out now on Netflix. I would I would also recommend uh, Winning Time, the HBO Lakers series, but don't because it's it's rated R. So <laughs> I'm not recommending that. Um, uh, also, make sure to check out the full feature we have with him in the spring issue of Relevant. It is available now at RelevantMagazine.com, the ad-supported web version. If you want an enhanced reading experience with no ads... Subscribe to Relevant Plus. You can do so right there. It's as low as two fifty a month. Also in the issue, you'll find Ryan Reynolds, no big deal, Shauna Nequist, Brooke Ligerwood, so many more. It is jam-packed. Channing Tatum. I didn't even have Channing Tatum on this list. We have so much content. Uh, Lisa Sharon Harper. It's just, it is absolutely packed. Uh, go check it out now. Hey, if you like the uh, music you hear on the podcast, you can find our playlist heard on the Relevant Podcast um, on Spotify. Uh, it's a good, it's a good follow. We get, it's updated every week. Why not? It's free. Also, uh, speaking of free, follow relevant on all the socials. Social media is free. You can get our content there too. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, a little bit on TikTok. Um, but definitely follow along for all the latest. And like I said, relevant plus go check it out. You can register for free at the site. You can, it unlocks a bunch of, new, a bunch more article views. Um, you also get, uh, by registering for relevant plus, you also get our top five trending articles in your inbox every Every morning, a relevant daily newsletter. And uh, again, Relevant Plus, as low as two fifty a month. It's our best content experience yet, and we appreciate the support. Go check it out. On that note, we'll wrap it up. I'm Cameron Strang. I'm Jesse Carey. I'm Derek Miner. I'm Emily Brown. I'm Tyler Huckabee. We'll see you next time. Don't miss it. We're going to be joined by Trip Lee. For listening to the relevant podcast check out our features interviews and news updates every day at relevantmagazine.com and make sure to follow relevant on facebook twitter and instagram for the latest for more great podcasts browse the shows on the relevant podcast network which you can find at our site and while you're there don't miss the all new era of relevant magazine a new issue releases every other month at relevantmagazine.com Musicals are terrible and boring. It's just a fact. Relevant Podcast Network.